Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Dr. Shariful Halim and today I'll talk about now, aniseids. So, aniseid, if you elaborate the word, you can find non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, you can assume that there is another group of anti-inflammatory drugs which are steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so um, let's, as, let's get a good idea about what inflammation is in brief. So inflammation is a response of your immune system to any tissue necrosis or any infection in your body, uh, which is followed by extravasation of inflammatory cells from inside the vessel to outside of the vessel to the tissue where there is the damage occurring by necrosis or in infection. And those cells actually produce a lot of chemical mediators which causes a typical presentation of inflammation. And among those, the most important are edema and pain and also fever. Okay, so before taking further moments, let's go to the discussions. Okay, so this slide, you can see uh, this is a busy slide. It has a lot of things. And let's start with uh, membrane phospholipids. Okay, so uh, every inflammatory cells has membrane cell membrane and every cell membrane in our body is is composed of a phospholipid bilayer uh, which has a phosphate head on the outside and a lipid tail in the inside and there is an enzyme which is present all, all over your body which is called phospholipase A2 and this enzyme actually breaks down the membrane phospholipids and produces arachidonic acid okay and this arachidonic acid can be can be broken down to different two different pathways one is cyclooxygenase pathway and another is lipooxygenase pathway. And let's first talk about cyclooxygenase pathway. In case of cyclooxygenase pathway, you have two enzyme isoforms, which are COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1 is present in all cells of your body and COX-2 is present only in the inflammatory cells. Okay, and those COX-1 and COX-2 produces some, uh, some chemical mediators which are also called cyclic endoperoxides. And among the cyclic endoperoxide, you can you can see that I have classified them into three main groups. Uh, some are prostaglandins, prostacycline, and thromboxane. So prostaglandins are the most important, which is the which is the main mediator of uh, inflammation. And among the prostaglandins, the PGE2 is the most important because it is associated with production of pain and also it is associated with production of fever. And and there is two opposing uh, prostaglandins, which are uh, prostacycline and thromboxanes. The prostacycline is a mediator which actually inhibits the uh, aggregation of the platelet and as you can uh, think that if a platelet aggregation is inhibited uh, there will be inhibition of formation of a thrombus in your vessel and thromboxen uh, you, you can see the name through thromboxen so something which is associated with thrombus so it's a drug which it's a chemical agent which will actually stimulate the production of a thrombus in the vessel wall okay so those two are opposing agents Okay, so those are the things about uh, cyclic endoperoxides, and the another pathway is arachidonic acid pathway, uh, in the is lipoxygenase pathway, which which is a pathway which produces a five HPET from arachidonic acid, and this five HPET will give rise to leukotrienes, which are actually classified into two broad groups. So in one group you have leukotriene C4, D4, and E4, which are also called slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. And those substances, those substances are actually uh, actually associated with the typical manifestations seen with asthma, such as bronchoconstriction. So those substances act on bronchial tree and causes bronchoconstriction. And leukotriene B4 is a chemical agent which actually uh, involved in neutrophil chemotaxis in acute inflammation. Okay, so that that's uh, that's the basic overview of the production of the chemical mediators of inflammation. Now let's try to inhibit their production. So let's try in the first step. So in the beginning, you have already mentioned. I've already mentioned that phospholipase A2 is the chief enzyme that produces all of those substances. So you can inhibit the phosph phospholipase A2 by corticosteroids, and the steroids, uh, as you know, uh, the steroids can also inhibit other parts of the immune system, which is like uh, extravasation of the immune cells from the blood vessel or release of immune cells from bone marrow and by those all the all those mechanisms corticosteroids actually cause immunosuppression and the patients who take corticosteroids for any reason they will have an increased susceptibility to the infection okay so next go to the cyclooxygenase pathway so in the cyclooxygenase pathway uh, there are some two types of drugs one type of drugs are inhibitor of cyclooxygenase uh, without any isotype isoform so they, they are non-selective inhibitors that inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. And there is another group which is selective inhibitor, which inhibits only COX-2, and, and those drugs will, will actually act on only inflammatory cell. 
as you can recall from my previous conversation okay so next let's go to the lipoxygenase pathway uh, we can inhibit the lipoxygenase enzyme itself by a drug called geloton and we can inhibit the receptors of ltc 4 d 4 ne 4 by montelukast or zafilukast so those lucas drugs are very important uh, drugs in asthma so i have already mentioned those drugs are associated with bronchoconstriction and asthma also is associated with bronchoconstriction so those drugs uh, th th sorry not those drugs those chemical mediators are associated with bronchoconstriction so those drugs will inhibit the bronchoconstriction by inhibiting inhibiting the action of the substances by inhibiting the uh, binding of the substance with their receptors so the receptor blockers so they are also called leukotriene receptor uh, antagonists okay so next uh, go to uh, uh, the fast drug of anesthet group which is aspirin which is the in unique drug which is very important for you to know and it inhibits the cox or cyclooxygenase both one and two and the inhibition of cox in aspirin and other anesthetes are different aspirin inhibits cox irreversibly and uh, those uh, aspirin also reduce the thromboxane too. So you can remember the thromboxane is a mediator of thrombosis. So if aspirin inhibits the thromboxane production, it will prevent thrombosis. So the most common uh, dose of aspirin is less than 300 milligrams, which is a 75 milligram aspirin used single uh, single dose daily for diseases which are associated with thrombus, such as coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease, which is in ischemic type. Okay, you can use aspirin in higher doses. And those higher doses are actually uh, for production of analgesic action in the intermediate dose range and production of uh, anti-inflammatory action in a high dose range. But they, they are not mo more commonly used. The most common use is low dose aspirin, 75 milligram, also called a baby aspirin. So let's talk about the toxicity of the aspirin that can present. Okay, so as I have mentioned that COX-1 is actually an enzyme present in all cells of your body and it's more predominant in the GI and renal system. And the GI system, especially it's active in the stomach, and in stomach it is responsible for production of the barrier, uh, uh, gastric protective barrier, which is consists of uh, mucus and also bicarbonate. And prostaglandin actually helps the, to maintain this barrier and prevents the corrosive action of the uh, acid to the stomach wall. So uh, if you if you use a drug which inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis. Uh, it, it's very easy to recon that it will lead to a decrease in the protective barrier. So the protective barrier will be lost or the protective barrier will be weaker and acid will take an upper hand and it, it will cause the damage to the gastric mucosa leading to gastric ulcer or renal ulcer or even uh, even perforation in some severe cases. Okay, in the renal system, the aspirin causes a decrease in prostaglandin synthesis and prostaglandins are vasodilators so it increases the blood flow to the kidney so if you inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins it will cause a reduction of blood flow to the kidney and can cause renal failure and another mechanism of renal failure by aspirin is interstitial nephritis so uh, it can happen in some very few cases and a very grave complication of aspirin can be present in in, in people or in especially in the children with viral infections so those in those those children with viral infection are highly susceptible to aspirin and that can produce a symptom syndrome which is also called a race syndrome so let me explain what happens in race syndrome in race syndrome the aspirin actually inhibits the enzymes of beta oxidation in liver and you know beta oxidation is a major source of energy for liver so if the liver doesn't have an doesn't have enough energy it can't actually do the things that it usually does and among the things that you do that it does the most important things the most important things the most important things are gluconeogenesis so it inhibits gluconeogenesis so as you can imagine if the gluconeogenesis is inhibited if the gluconeogenesis is inhibited the the blood sugar level will decrease in postprandial period so race syndrome is associated with uh, hypoglycemia and also also, if you if you can't metabolize the fatty acids well, those will accumulate in the liver and will cause a fatty liver. And you, you can imagine if a patient has uh, hypoglycemia and also hypoglycemia and also hypoglycemia and also uh, fatty liver disease, it can lead to liver failure. Uh, hepat especially fatty liver disease can lead to liver failure and it can be associated with hepatic encephalopathy, which can be fatal in some cases. So it's very important to know. Uh, and 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 also you can imagine that if the liver is uh, embedded with a lot of fat a lot of fat is stored in the liver the liver will be enlarged so there will be also happen okay next is metabolic derangement aspirin is an acid 
So uh, another name for aspirin is salicylic acid or salicylate. So if you have a large dose of aspirin, it will cause metabolic acidosis. And there is also a fun thing that if aspirin is uh, taken, aspirin can also cause a stimulation of the respiratory system or respiratory center. And this respiratory center stimulation will result in hyperventilation. It will increase your ventilatory rate and you will lose a lot of carbon dioxide, which will lead to respiratory alkalosis. But another fun thing is if someone takes a lot of aspirin, it will actually inhibit the respiratory center, it will reduce the hair respiratory rate, and now you will have a buildup of carbon dioxide. So you will have respiratory acidosis. So remember that fast aspirin causes a metabolic acidosis, then it can also cause respiratory alkalosis, and ultimately in higher doses, it can also cause respiratory acidosis. Okay, remember that. Okay, aspirin can also cause some problems with coagulation because as I've already mentioned, aspirin uh, inhibits platelet by reducing thromboxane A2 and that's why there may be platelet dysfunction leading to increase in uh, bleeding time. So bleeding time will be increased in patients, but the prothrombin time or uh, activated partial thromboplastin times will be normal. Okay, so let's go to other NSAIDs. I have divided other NSAIDs into two main groups. Uh, I have just put the main, the most important drugs that you must remember, which are high efficacy and low efficacy or medium efficacy. So high efficacy drugs are Keterolac and Diclofenac. And Diclofenac is a very good analgesic, which is commonly used in our hospital, in Dhaka Medical College uh, Hospital, as a suppository form. And there is a common common trade name of suppository of Diclofenac, which is Boltanin. And we use at a dose of 50 milligram, and it can use for severe pain in any patient. Okay, Ketorolac is also a very good uh, drug for a uh, high efficacy NSAIDs and there are some medium efficacy or low efficacy NSAIDs which are ibuprofen, naproxen or indomethacin. All of them are used mainly in rheumatologic disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis or something like that. Okay, so that and, and the mechanism that, uh, that uh, aspirin does inhibit the uh, COX and NSAIDs also inhibit the COX but the inhibition is different. This inhibition is a reversible inhibition. Okay, okay. next we can use NSAIDs as antipyretics. Why? Because I have already mentioned prostaglandin E2 is a mediator of fever. So if you reduce the COX, if you you will reduce the production of prostaglandin E2 and you will cause reduction of fever. So it will act as antipyretics. And prostaglandin E2 is also a mediator of anal, a mediator of pain. So if you reduce the PGE2, you will also cause a reduction in pain. And it is also an anti-inflammatory drug because all other prostaglandins causes vasodilation and vascular permeability, a raise of vascular permeability. So it will actually cause a decreased vasodilation and decrease in, in, a decrease in edema, in the tissue edema. And another fun thing to remember is indomethacin is also associated. You can also use indomethacin for closure of PDA or patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, you can remember PDA, uh, which is which is actually a congenital defect, which uh, which actually uh, which is uh, ductus arteriosus is a is a, th is a, a general congenital structure which is present, which connects your uh, aorta, especially the arch of aorta, with the pulmonary trunk. So it closes uh, just after birth, but if it doesn't close, us, you can close it with drugs like indomethacin. And the mechanism is that uh, indomethacin will cause a decrease in prostaglandins, and prostaglandins are vasodilator. So if you decrease the vasodilator, what you do? You do a vasoconstriction. So you will constrict the ductus arteriosus and that's how you can actually close the ductus arteriosus. And toxicity profiles of NSAIDs are same as uh, aspirin. It will cause renal problems such as renal failure and it will cause the gastric problems such as gastric erosions, gastric ulcer and even perforations. Okay, that's all about the basic NSAIDs. Now we can talk about the COX-2 inhibitors which are celecoxib, rofecoxib and valdecoxib. And as I've mentioned, they are selective COX-2 inhibitors, so they will not have any GI side effects. And also, renal side effects are less, but, but still present. But the GI side effects are the main uh, main thing that is not present in the COX-2 inhibitors. Okay, so you can use them in rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. But one problem is they are prothrombotic, and they can cause allergy with if you use them with sulfonamides. So one another drug which is also discussed along with NSAIDs, but it's not a typical NSAID. It's a different type of drug, which is uh, in the US name is acetaminophen and the UK name is paracetamol. And it's also an inhibitor of COX, but it's a very special inhibitor because it only inhibits the COX in the CNS or central nervous system. And by inhibiting COX in central nervous system, it reduces prostaglandin E1 in the central nervous system. And that's why it, 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 is used, it can be used as antipyretic agent because reduce reduction of prostaglandin E1 in the region 
uh, around hypothalamus will cause a, a decrease in temperature set point leading to uh, antibiotic effect okay and also it can be used as analgesic due to its central effect but that you look look that it's not anti-inflammatory because in inflammation you will have actually activity of cox2 which is inducible and which is peripheral so uh, paracetamol is peripherally inactivated so it it can only act on central central so uh, and and why that happens is very simple acetaminophen is a lipid drug and it can easily cross the blood brain barrier and cause central effects okay and uh, acetaminophen or paracetamol is a very good analgesic and antibiotic in case of children because i have already mentioned if the children has a viral fever you shouldn't use aspirin because this aspirin can lead to uh, race syndrome okay so paracetamol can lead to some toxicities if someone takes a lot of paracetamols like 10 grams or more it will be a very toxic dose and this this causes a toxic metabolite which is known as napqy a bizarre name and elaboration is n acetyl p benzo quino quinone imine so it's a tough name to remember uh, my my teeth are breaking out to to, uh, to actually pronounce it okay you can you can remember the brief form okay this napqy which is a metabolite of paracetamol this actually depletes glutathione and as you can remember glutathione is a very important antioxidant it actually takes up all the superoxide or all the substances all the uh, free radicals in your uh, in your tissues and actually detoxify them so if you have if you don't have a lot of glutathione uh, you will have a buildup of free radicals which will damage your cell membranes damage the dna damage the proteins so uh, by this mechanism if a patient has a toxic overdose of paracetamol he will have hepatic necrosis liver failure and hepatic encephalopathy okay so to counter that effect you can use an it is anacetyl cysteine which will actually uh, reverse the effect of napqi to glutathione and regenerate the glutathione and, and get the patient better okay so i think that's all from me today thanks for watching my video and stay tuned for newer videos